I think my biggest tip is just get started. Um, I meet a lot of young entrepreneurs who have good ideas or bad ideas or some ideas uh, and you don't want to be a person who just talks and talks and talks. You have to actually go and do something. And don't worry about uh, if it's the perfect thing or not. There is this myth of entrepreneurship that you'll have the one genius idea and suddenly everything falls into place. It doesn't work like that. It's a hard slog. There's a lot of things to do wrong, a lot of things you'll do right. Um, the sooner you get started, the sooner you'll get somewhere. You know, one of the things that I tell people when they ask me for advice about what they should do when they're wanting to start their own business uh, or take a next step in their career is to actually start small. I think a lot of people try to, um, they kind of psych themselves out or they get too overwhelmed with how big something can get. But the truth is, you really just got to start small and you got to prove it before you scale it. If I had to choose one thing that really motivates me that I can recommend to a lot of young entrepreneurs, it's having that, finding and understanding why you're doing what you're doing, you know, having a sense of purpose. Because oftentimes I've, I meet so many aspiring entrepreneurs and they have these great ideas, but they don't even know why they're doing it. Money should be a byproduct of what you love to do. Try to do something that you would want to do anyway, whether it's, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a very successful business because um, when you do decide to become an entrepreneur and start a business, chances are it's not going to do, it's not going to become like a multi-million dollar business. So at least do something that you love in the beginning so that even if it fails, you'd still enjoy it. Make sure you choose, you know, when, you, when you're trying to decide whether or not an idea is good enough to pursue or, or a particular business is something you want to you go forward with, make sure that it's the type of business that when you're standing in the shower, it's the thing you want to think about for the next 10 or 20 years. Basically, the theory is we're all born thinking like entrepreneurs. You know, like when we crawl and we, start, and we fall, uh, you know, when we're trying to walk, we figure it out. Entrepreneurs always figure out, you're born thinking like an entrepreneur that, you know what, I'm going to figure this out regardless and I'm going to keep going. Now, often the challenge is families and friends convince you not to be an entrepreneur because when you say I'm going to change the world, I'm going to be the most famous person, I'm going to save the seals, they say don't do that. You, it, it didn't happen before. Yeah. You, it's never happened. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to fail. You're going to embarrass us. They put the limiters on it. They put the limiters on yeah. They put the blinders on you, but true entrepreneurs will just keep figuring it out. And you know what everybody wants to hear? What they already believe to be true. And so the last thing they want to hear is an original idea that contradicts their belief system. So it's very hard to even bring that kind of stuff up. But those are the things, those are the only things, things that you believe that everybody around you doesn't believe when you're right that create real value in the world. Everything else people already know. There's no value created. It's just business as usual. So it's so important to think for yourself. Don't solicit feedback on your product, your idea, or your business just for validation purposes. Be really careful about that. You want to tell the people that can help move your idea forward, but if you're just looking to your friend, coworker, husband, wife for validation, be careful because out of love and concern, a lot of people will express some concerns and it can stop a lot of multi-million dollar ideas right in their tracks in the beginning. Because if you build something for yourself, if you build something that you love, that you think is sufficiently epic, if you make something that you love, there's probably another billion people in the world that love it as well. You need to focus on solutions, not ideas. All of us here are really creative, and we come up with loads of ideas throughout the day, and we become really excited about that. And say, dude, we should start a company around that. But that's when you actually go to the other side, where you talk to, uh, where you, you know, find out what someone. Um, actually a, prob a problem that they have and solve that is, is when uh, you know, real value comes out. And I think where is the opportunity? The opportunity li always lies in the place where people complain. Some people sit there complain, you think, mm, if I can solve that complaint, that's the opportunity. I would say that the lesson learned for me to anybody else out there interested in starting a business is 
please find something you're passionate about because it's so much work, it's so much time, it's so much effort, but if the subject matter is something that you, you genuinely love uh, to be involved with, it's, it's not gonna be that big of a drag and it's not gonna be that big, much work. It's gonna be incredibly exciting and, and rewarding because to your point, you'll feel like you're living your, the life that you're meant to live. Be great at one thing. The world will reward your knowledge of a very narrow field. Be world class at one thing. Forget your weaknesses because somebody is gonna eat your lunch at the stuff you're not good at. And I got, can't stress this enough, choosing your partners has got to be maybe the most important decision you'll ever make, whether uh, you know, personally in, in, in love or otherwise in business. You can change your idea, you can pivot your company, you can't change your partners without starting over. And so I see so many people rushing into these relationships. I mean, you should really give that a lot of thought. This is something that hopefully will last years. So today you should think, okay, my co-founders, do we, do we cover a lot of surface area? Do we have different skill sets? And is it somebody that, that I trust fundamentally? And that's, those are really, really, really important questions to ask yourself, because if so, then you have a really strong foundation to go forward. You have to decide if you're gonna be a slow growth company or a get big fast company, because anytime you try to straddle uh, those two lines, painful things happen to you. Everybody thought we were crazy. Um, we probably were crazy, but having a dream like that, that resonates with people, changing the world, achieving something big, it turns out that's what pulls you through the hard times. Every company has a hard, has hard times. Uh, every company has setbacks, and it's having that, that, that mountain in the distance that you're trying to scale, um, that is what gets everybody through. And if you're really trying to achieve something, then sort of say, hey, here's my vision, and I like to say be obstinate about your vision, but be really flexible about your tactics. What does that mean? It's sort of like think big, act small. Uh, what that means is it's important to have a vision of where you're trying to go. How you get there is a series of experiments. Now, you can call them failures when they don't work, but they're learning experiments where you try things, see what works, try the next thing. If you're gonna start your own thing, you know, maybe you have a grand, grand vision of like all the different features it's gonna have and all the different you know, revenue lines you're gonna do and you know, keep, keep that vision, but do one piece of that first and do it really, really, really well. It's so much better to do a few things well than many things poorly. People really love simplicity. So if you look at the problems with large software like Microsoft Office, Every feature in Microsoft Office, somebody wanted at some time. But what happens is over 10 or 20 years, the thing gets so huge, it's overwhelming. So the discipline of great product design is to figure out what are the important cases for the long term and to have the discipline to say no to some things that are good. It's easy to say no to things that are bad, but great product design is saying no to some things that are good. Generally speaking, you should resist the temptation of adding too many features. It's all about either solving a problem or providing a value to, to a user. So there are a number of decisions that we make every day, and on a product side, there are a billion different features that we could make. So the hard part is really choosing which ones to focus on, which ones to build, and you only have a finite number that you can't actually execute on. So for us, a lot of it is just listening to the community and more importantly, understanding you know, what features they're asking for, but why are they asking for these specific things? What's the root problem they're trying to solve or goal that they're trying to achieve? And a lot of that is based on actual behavior. So not just what they say, but what they do. You can't ever sort of balance two completely contradictory things as a, as a means of hedging. You have to decide what are you going to believe in and put all of your energy behind that. And that's, that's the, those are the kinds of strategic decisions and trade-offs that you make every day as an entrepreneur. And it's important that you create the level of clarity and conviction to go after an opportunity that isn't hedging you know, lots of different ideas or lots of different approaches because that's the surest way that you'll never be good at, at sort of anything. And I find, even with myself, that it's really hard to do a minimum viable product that's minimum, that you're constantly thinking, no, no, it really has to have this other partner, it really has to have this, and then you overbuild and then you have to unbuild and debuild, <laughs> which is very disappointing. So um, doing a minimum viable product is really important and 
it's even more minimum than you think it is. You're really trying to solve a new problem in a different way. You have to come to problems with beginner's mind, right? Not knowing something can be a very powerful tool into accomplishing it because you don't know that it's not possible. That's what doing a startup is. Not realizing that something is impossible and doing it anyway. We get to create any company we want, right? We get to create the reason for its existence. We get to create the rules of the game and who we hire and how we hire them and who can stay and who can't stay, right? It's, it's beautiful. And so I just would encourage everyone that as we all contemplate life to try to um, question the assumptions that we live by and the default options that are given to us and expand our thinking to wonder what we really can do with our lives. And what do leaders look like? First and foremost, leaders always have a herd. People always like following leaders. Maybe it's their charisma, maybe it's their personality, maybe it's because they're so in belief of what they say that you have the ability to convince people to buy into your vision, not just for a paycheck. It's something more than that. Because great leaders, they don't only really have a herd, they fight for their herd, and the herd knows that. That's your job as entrepreneurs. These are not employees that do your bidding. These are partners that you should bring into your space. And you should be treated like that. And they should be treated like that, with respect and with dignity. But ultimately, the biggest thing, and what I spill, still spend from a third to a majority of my time on, is hiring. Uh, nothing has the impact of uh, getting the right people around the table. And you can't manage your way out of a bad team. Uh, values are you know, who you are. Right? You don't have personal values, professional values. It's really what you stand for. And again, there's no black and white answer here. There's no right or wrong value. But if you're building a team or building an organization, you want to understand your identity. And then it mostly impacts hiring. It impacts the way that you decide to add people to your team. Um, otherwise, you can become uh, very, very split in terms of what your mission is. Uh, and so some of the best I got, advice I got was from uh, Paul Graham, one of the investors in Stripe. Uh, who, who talks a lot about unscalable strategies for user acquisition. Uh, say, for example, you helping each user personally. Sure, that won't scale as you grow to a very large st size, but when a startup is just starting out, uh, it, it really helps you have an advantage as a small and nimble company. If you're going to have a breakout startup, you've really got to think about how you're going to innovate on distribution, not just product. Right? And the, the biggest mistake I see these days is that um, I see brilliant startup founders who are brilliant product people and they've really thought about their product but they haven't really thought about how they're going to make it grow and then they launch their product and it's like crickets chirping no one no one's using it and they're kind of flummoxed as to what to do because they've never really spent time thinking about it and they just kind of assume that if, hey if you build a good product everyone's going to find it and the reality is it's a big web out there and um, that's not necessarily true. You know, I think what I see right now is people wrap up their sense of success and identity with their prowess in fundraising and comparing themselves against how their peers are doing. Uh, I think that's really the wrong way to, to look at things, and it, and it leads to uh, kind of non-optimal outcomes. Um, for instance, I don't know if the valuations that companies are getting today is necessarily healthy for the company themselves. And for us, again, you know, our inability to raise capital actually forced us to be very disciplined in how we think about the operational metrics of the company. And that's allowed us to uh, you know, be pretty successful. I think that's what people always have to ask themselves. Do you believe in the concept of what you're doing? Do you believe that there's really a there there? Conviction. If you can figure out the right you know, product package or the right way to reach users, and if you believe that, then you know, keep, keep scrapping, because usually there's a way. And so it's about this movement forward, not what you own, not your education or your pedigree, not a pile of resources you might have at hand, not your network, just going after this thing and knowing that as you do that, you'll find what you need, you'll make your way over, around, and through. And I think the best entrepreneurs that I've met are able to do that because they have this strong vision and they know that it's worth it to keep moving forward. Larger, more established entities can't move as quickly as you can. And, um, Success and scale and size all fight against this. And I would encourage you for the longest possible time as you sort of start your own companies to, to look for ways to stay agile. So you know the most important thing you can actually advise yourself or anyone else? Is ignore your mistakes. Like, 
what is your problem? You're good at some things, just go do that. The number one thing you should worry about is am I doing the things that I'm good at? When you start with a, your company, you're gonna have a lot of anxiety and stress and fear, and your job is to transform that into uh, self-confidence and to give you kind of that, you know, the ability to say, I have clarity, I trust myself, I have a feeling for my vision, I can see that happening. I work with entrepreneurs all the time. That kind of shift from, you know, anxiety to trust, that's the most important thing that, that, that they can go through. Building really great companies just takes a while, and it's good to not try to do it too fast. It's really, really, really good to be ambitious, obviously. Um, but it's not that great to be too hasty. Uh, be lucky. <laughs> I think when I give that advice, be lucky. It's a little bit glib, but I think there's also looking out for those opportunities and being conscious um, and being aware and looking for opportunities to, to be lucky. Because you can definitely put yourself in a position where luck isn't going to make any difference. It's not necessarily about the, the exit or the outcome. It's, it's about the journey. So it's, uh, for me, it's just, I, I think you just, you just need to enjoy that aspect of it. It's, uh, you know, because it's not an always uh, an easy ride. It's, uh, it's a lot of up, ups and downs along the way, but as long as you're personally fulfilled uh, by that experience and genuinely enjoy what you do, then it makes it worthwhile. I think, you know, if you know why you're doing something and what it is that you're trying to get, then it's a question of being very, very open to failure and, um, and just, you know, trying again and again and again until you get it. The beauty of failing is if you're open to admitting the failure and learning from it, um, you probably won't fail again in that one department and you'll know what to expect next time and that just makes you stronger and, and more accurate with the risks that you take. A rule of thumb is to only worry about the next order of magnitude. So when you have 100 users, worry about what the company looks like, can it survive to 1,000? 1,000? 10,000, and so on and so forth. If you're worrying about the millionth user and their experience and how your technology is gonna scale when you have 100 users, you're, you're pointed in the wrong direction. But we realized it pays to be a cockroach. And, and by that, I mean, uh, it pays just to not stop and just to not die. Like, we thought, you know, everything along the way had tried to kill us, right? Like, all of our friends were like, startups are dumb, uh, you're dumb, your ideas are dumb. Um, <laughs> And we kind of just looked at all of them and said, whatever, uh, and built Code Academy. So it pays not to quit. Go talk to people who failed at what you're doing um, <laughs> and who are no longer doing it. Um, there always are those people. Um, so you started a startup. You know, you look at the history of your space. I'm so surprised how many people I talk to, founders who have no idea the history of their own space. <laughs> and there's some night. There's some nice naivete to that in the sense that like, oh, you're gonna do it differently. And, um, and there, there's some truth to that. But like, when you get down to, to, to making it work and now you're into it already, you, you've kind of established what you're doing, you have some problems, then I'd go talk to all these people who failed. Because you, you'll uncover all sorts of interesting uh, things that you could try. You know, I looked at lots of companies and why I thought they don't succeed over time. And we've had a more rapid turnover of companies. And I said, what did they fundamentally do wrong? Like, what do those companies all do wrong? And they usually it's just they miss the future. And so I think, for me, I just try to focus on that and say, what is that future really going to be, and how do we create it? I think great entrepreneurs must have the curiosity to, to kind of metaphorically see around the corner. What's coming? What can I anticipate that other people don't see? Um, and then you must have the courage of your convictions to execute the strategy. I do believe that organizations, human organizations, are inherently unstable. They will fall over, and you have to work to keep them upright. But they fall slowly. Most people don't notice it. They let their success blind them. They don't see it falling over. The falling takes place slow, but the collapse is quick. Um, you have to do constant assessment. Um, you have to look for the hard truths. There's a lot of conventional wisdom out there, built up over time and built through all the learnings from all the companies. 
And this may be fully applicable to most of the companies out there, but before it's applied to your organization, I highly recommend that you question it because it could be absolutely fatal for your success.